Good morning, Judith. Good, good morning, Frank. It's good to see you. It is um, the same. We, we're on the same timeline. It doesn't happen. Uh, timeline, time zone, sorry. It doesn't happen that often. Um, uh, you're in Paris right now. Um, I had planned, obviously, um, I'd worked on this interview for a few days. Um, and um, But the horror of what's happening in Gaza, um, you know, gets more and more horrifying. And uh, so we've learned yesterday that uh, Rifat Al-Arir um, and his family, his brother, his sister, and four of his uh, sister's children was massacred uh, by uh, the Israeli army. Um, and, and Rifat was well known to the English speaking world because he was um, actually giving news from, from Gaza in English. Yes. So a lot of people relied on his news and updates. Uh, he, was, he wrote a book called Gaza Writes Back. He was a poet and author. Yes, I know it. I know it. And he was also a, um, one of the founders of We Are Not Numbers, this organization in Gaza that um, humanized or rehumanized the, the people uh, of Gaza. Because as you well know, the people of, of, of Palestine, like the people of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of Yemen, of Syria, are often just, just numbers when it comes to, to the mainstream media. Uh, if you can bear with me, I want you to, write, to read the last poem he wrote please, on please. November 1st, because it's, 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 um, it's telling and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about the conversation I want to have with you. So, um, so Rifat wrote this poem on November 1st. Uh, the poem was titled, If I Must Die. And it goes like this. If I must die, you must leave to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of clothes and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back, bringing back love, love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. Um, sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to start with because the, the numbers coming out of Gaza are just um, out of anything I've heard before. And again, because Rifat was behind this organization called We Are Not Numbers. I wanted to ask you something you've worked on a lot. Um, when is life actually grievable, Judith? Well, it should be now. Hmm. I'm, I'm caught by that line, if I must die, you know. Um, I mean, he should not have had to die. It, there was no necessity for him to die. Um, if I must die, if I must die in the sense that if the forces, the Israeli forces come for me, if the bombs come for me, I, I want to say um, simply that he he should not have died, and um, and of course that goes for all the people in Gaza who have lost their lives. And I know that we should be wary of statistics, but we know that the the pace of death and the number of deaths far exceeds um, uh, anything we have known in in recent history, um, and. Uh, to answer your question more directly, um, there have to be conditions for grievability. In other words, 
first of all, people have to be understood as human. <laughs> That's such a redundancy. And yet it's so very, very hard. And there are all kinds of ways of dehumanizing one, you know, when the Israeli general says, oh, there are no Palestinian civilians. Um, what he's saying is that there are no civilian deaths, which means there's no um, abrogation of the ethics of war. There's no war crimes. There's no crimes against humanity. There's no genocide. So soon, or if you say they're animals, uh, or what seems to amount to the same thing, terrorists, then um, the taking of animal life is not the same as genocide. Um, and the killing of terrorists is always presumptively justified through self-defense. Indeed, the justification through self-defense is, as we know, an ever-expanding one. Every act of aggression can be called self-defense if what you imagine and what, you, what your propaganda says is that um, Palestinians are... Uh, beings who want nothing other than the death of Israeli Jews. So if they get defined that way, they're a kind of vessel for genocide or a vessel through which um, the Nazi genocide is reproduced uh, in the minds of Israelis, then you're fighting the Palestinians as you would fight the Nazis. So at that point, the Palestinians become Nazis. So they are not civilians. They are all Hamas, they are terrorists, or they are animals, or they are the new Nazis, the return of the Nazi threat. And in every case, killing is not only justified, but mandatory in the name of a self-defense, which um, operates opportunistically to rationalize every act of murder. So under those conditions, none of those people are grievable uh it's it is in the, in the minds of those who think um that this slaughter is justifiably in the defense of the state of israel in their minds um uh nothing less than um full destruction or dispersion will satisfy the demand for self-defense. And we also um, or will protect them from this uh, apparently murderous uh, force. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of um, projection and inversion since, as we know, um, many people have described the actions, the slaughter of Palestinian life as genocide, either acts with genocidal intent or annihilationist. And we now have several hundred jurists. Last time I saw, there were 800 who signed onto a, a statement claiming that this does what we're seeing now uh, conforms with the genocide convention's definition. So when you are not just targeting a group and seeking to obliterate them, but also targeting the infrastructure of life, then you are um, qualified. <laughs> you qualify yourself <laughs> as genocidal actor. And, um, and I think we have to use that term. I think it's, it's really most important. Um, but we're left with a larger quandary, which is how do genocidal regimes construct the group against which they wage uh, murderous power uh, as non-grievable? These are lives that, if they are lost, it doesn't matter, or should be lost, right? It's only through the death of these others that the first group, the murderous group, the 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 murder through state violence group, uh, uh, understands itself as um, defended, properly defended, properly protected. So there is a kind of doctrine of ungrievability, we might say, that goes along with 
genocidal calculation and self justification. Thank, thank you, Judith. I, I, um, I want to read like a, a few, a few numbers to, um, I mean, I know people know that, but we are up to, and it's kind of conservative numbers, 20,000 dead, 20. um, more than six, including more than 6,000 children, hundreds of thousands of injured, including very seriously injured, millions displaced. Over half of Gaza's homes have been hit since October 7th, and this, these are the numbers of a few days ago. Uh, Jan Egeland of the Norwegian Refugee Council recently said, the, the pulverizing of Gaza now ranks amongst the worst assaults on any civilian population in our time and age. Um, the Antonio, Gute Antonio Guterres, of, uh, you know, the, secretary, the um, sec secretary General of the United Nations, um, invoked ar Article 99 yesterday, yes. which has rarely happened ever in history, to say that we are at the moment in a way, at, at a fork for human civilization on its whole, you know, and the UN Security Council should, should, should call for a permanent ceasefire. Um, can we say, in a way, uh, that this is really one of the worst, if not the worst, moment? Human civilization, I want, I want to think of us as, as a, a collective. I, I'm not going to say as experienced ever. But as had to experience in the last few decades, and I'm also saying this because I remember I was uh, I'm old enough to remember that when the Iraq War started in 2003, we saw this live on television. I remember sitting in front of the TV and the first U.S. sort of missile going, and and George Bush saying like, "That's it, we are at war." And this is also one of the worst moments because we are experiencing as a collective and i hope I, I i i hang to this belief that we are a collective human civilization human beings we are experiencing the first genocide live on tv uh which makes it even harder to to, to um to to live in a way and go through so yeah uh, uh yeah sorry i I agree with you, but I also think that if we take a comparative genocide perspective, <laughs> uh, there are there are genocides that are radically unmarked um, through media, and media has also changed. So what it means to mark or register or see a genocide is very different than in the 1990s when there was a genocide in Rwanda without any adequate uh, uh, international intervention. Um, and we read about that and there are pictures of that and people who care about genocide study that, um, but it, it will never have the kind of um, publicity um, or um, intelligibility uh, that this one has, and partly because um, of the way in which major powers are backing the Israeli regime. So if we depend on major powers or something that we loosely call the international community, which is a big question what that is, who constitutes that, who's in and who's out, uh, which powers hold are able to hold on to that name. But if we depend on those powers to intervene, if we think that those powers are mm, obligated to hold to basic international law or to the Convention Against Genocide or even war crimes or atrocities, to, no matter which legal rubric you use, you would think that there would be an even more um, robust um, intervention to stop this violence. So, you know, there's a way in which you and I are both 
implicated. I'm more implicated than you because I'm from the United States and Biden has um, horrifically thrown uh, his lot in with Netanyahu uh, in such a way that we will probably see a Trump uh, election, something I didn't believe in two months ago, but I now think is almost inevitable. But, you know, the horror, the horror of what we're seeing is compounded by the horror of the lack of intervention. And can we see the one without the other? I think not. I think for those of us who um, believe <laughs> that major states and the United Nations and international organizations should be intervening uh, to stop the Israeli government, they should be boycotting. They should be bar they should they should be imposing embargoes. They should do all the things that we expect governments to do to stop gen genocidal actions. Um, and we don't see that. Instead, instead, we see astonishing complicity. At which point, we have to ask ourselves not only why this support for Israel is so reflex reflex driven, you know, as it is, say, in Germany, uh, in France, for the most part, but not completely. And in the centers of power in the United States, although not among the youth, apparently. Uh, um, if, if we ask ourselves that, I mean, part of it has to do with the, the history of the genocide against the Jews and how that has now moved into a certain ideological formation that people are terrified to contest for fear of the accusation of anti-Semitism. But some of it is actually, uh, and I would say most of it is uh, is is racism, and it's a racism that goes along with a colonial state um, that has been able to maintain its colonizing practices and powers without intervention. Why, why would there be intervention now? I had a Swiss reporter say to me, why do you, why do you call Israel a settler colonial power? <laughs> like as if that was hate speech on my part. And I had to point out to him that in the 19th century, the early Zionists were committed to colonization. They used the term. It was not a term of disrepute. It was a it was very exciting for them to act like other European nations and to go to Palestine and colonize the people. And they, you know, Ilan Papa uh, demonstrates this with um, lots of documentation. But there's an enormous racism that's going on here. And, and uh, Palestinian life is not um, considered valuable life. And it's also uh, infused with phantasms and uh, and there's a colonial imaginary with with violent consequences that takes hold. If we if if the United States buys the idea that Israel is a democracy, um, if it says, "Oh, it's the only democracy in the Middle East," and this state formation is based on displacement, destruction. Uh, dispossession, land theft, uh, unjust imprisonment, indefinite detention, constant bombardment, siege, uh, uh, checkpoints that are centers of surveillance and harassment, uh, settler violence. What what qualifies this as a democracy? This this. This is not a democracy. It is a colonial, a violent colonial state that has been able to pass itself off as the only democracy. And it denies democratic rights to the millions of people who are either in the West Bank or in Gaza still, or uh, in forced exile, who do have proper rights of return. So if it's based on a systematic denial of rights, basic rights that we associate with democracy, in what sense is this a democracy? If it is, then democracy is a lie, and we should all be 
you know, very skeptical of democracies. But if we're not, if we if we wish for radical democracy, as I do, then we hold it accountable. But we're seeing the failure of states to do this, and we're also seeing um, the rationalization of a of an unfathomable slaughter um, through a through a failure of courage and a failure of criticism. Uh, something that, and again, I, I, obviously, I'm, I'm not in, in Gaza. I'm not Palestinian. But but some, you, you know, when there's war, when there's a massacre, we focus or the media focuses on numbers, the numbers of people killed, the numbers of people injured. But there are other elements that should we that we should take into consideration. Uh, Save the Children wrote in June 2022. So a year ago, more than a year ago, that after 15 years of blockade, four out of five children in Gaza lived with depression, grief, and fear. I remember after Operation Cast Lead in 2009 that a, a report by the British Medical Journal said that more than 50% of the youth in Gaza had lost the will to live. Yes. Then you have a recent poll asking Palestinians. Which country do you think supports you? 56% responded, none. None. And now, and we've seen it with Rifat, I see on social media a lot of posts from journalists in Gaza, from people in Gaza, saying like, our death is pending. I now know that I will not survive. Rifat wrote, if I must die. It's so horrific uh, that I know around me, activists uh, uh, in, in Brussels, in Paris, in, in the UK, um, that have buried themselves in work and activism and action over the last eight weeks, not to think of, about the true momentous, horrible nature of what's happening. On the ver I mean, I know we're not in Gaza, but at the verge of, of, of psychological collapse. So, so some people around me, uh, there's so much anger, they just don't know what to do anymore. Um, and some of them I know have already collapsed, you know, emotionally. Um, JVP posted yesterday, um, we owe Gaza endurance. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes, and, and how, again, as a collective, because this is a collective moment of, of, of trauma, how can we go through this? How can we, yes. you know? You know, I think um, some people say, uh, <laughs> don't grieve, act, or don't grieve, um, uh, fight. Um, I actually say grief and rage go together. We wouldn't be so angry and so appalled if we were not registering the loss at some level. And at least we are registering the loss because those who are inflicting it or are complicit with it are either celebrating it or indifferent to it. Or, you know, there's a certain desensitization, desensitization that happens through the media and through certain forms of neutral reporting that um, is very dangerous because the minute we cease to respond emotionally to, to, feel, to feel the loss of this, this poet, this reporter, this, this person who gave testimony, if we, if, we, if we didn't feel that or if we thought, oh, I can't afford to feel that, we wouldn't actually have the rage or the, um, uh, the desire to respond and to intervene. So I actually think rage, grief, and the demand for justice go together. Um, we have to remain responsive. We have to feel the loss. That doesn't mean we get lost to grief. Some of us will, and certainly people there. You noted the deep psychic damage done to children, that, but the how any of the people who survive these bombardments and these massive losses, how, how any of them will survive psychically is completely unclear. The 
the mental health clinic uh, in Gaza will become, uh, I don't know, uh, if, if there is still Gaza, if there are survivors, how will they how will they survive? I have no idea. But for those of us on the outside um, who believe in fighting for justice in Palestine, we have to hold on to networks of solidarity like JVP, uh, like Students for Justice in Palestine in the U.S., but all these groups throughout Europe that have um, rallied in different ways to support Palestine. We all need to be there for one another. And that means gathering. That means talking. That means um, allowing for a whole range of emotions to be expressed, but also allowing that grief and rage to become language planning, activism, solidarity, and also then finding ways to regenerate ourselves. I mean, I also feel like I wake up and I think, oh, my God, what am I going to do today to stop this? Right. And sometimes it's just editing a letter that somebody's writing to contest the loss of employment for someone who said something in support of Palestine or critical of Israel. Uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, mainly academic freedom issues for me, but also explaining to co on college campuses why anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism. I am, you know, you call me, you wind me up. I, I'm i there, I can do it. But, you know, there, the, if I don't do something every day, I, I, I am, I'm shaking. And so I must, at the same time, I need to figure out what I can do best, what we can do best from our position and with whatever skills or resources we have, because some of us can do things better than others. You offer this podcast, and which I, I'm thrilled to watch. And as you know, it's it's given me solace on certain mornings when I found no so solace. Um, but we have to um we have to support Palestine and make sure that's at the center of things. Um I do think there the obligation to endure involves the obligation to regenerate ourselves, to find out what we can do at what pace and in what way, because we all cannot do everything and none of us are saviors. It's really important not to develop a kind of egoism about that. Um, what do I need to read and learn so that I can be a more informed critic? What do I need to listen to so that my own views uh, prior to October 7th can be, can be challenged and and I can revise what I think and what I know. Um, so all of that is important. Um, and I think we have to be grateful for our own lives that we can continue to live, to be part of a global resistance. Um, and there is joy in that. There is joy in that, finding people who share what you feel and who have the same hopes. Um, I do think that's right. If we destroy ourselves in our activism, then we are not any good for Palestine. I, I couldn't agree with this more. Uh, and but that's uh, and that's a very difficult thing to tell people. Yes, that are not because in Gaza. we have the luxury. We have the luxury of, of saying to ourselves, "Oh, what can I do today?" You know, and still stay well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of people don't have that. Yeah. And who, who are just going to be fighting day and night and will exhaust themselves and become ill at some point. Illness will stop them. And then they have to be taken care of so that they can come back up and fight again. Yeah. We need networks of care. Maybe we yeah, should yeah. remind ourselves of the networks of care that were produced under the pandemic, the networks of care that have always been there during the AIDS, the, the AIDS uh, crisis in the Euro-Atlantic world and elsewhere, um, we, we need to remember that we, we have to be part of networks of interdependency and offer, um, offer, uh, offer our own um, powers of listening and care so that others can regenerate and, and act again. Yeah. 
this is really crucial. Um, and what I've been, what I've, what I've, what I have been trying to hold on to since uh, October seventh, but obviously many years before, you know, uh, is um, is the beauty around around us, because that you know the world is full of horrible things, and we right now is an example of one of the most horrible things we can experience as as a human being. But it's also full of beauty, and the fact that eight hundred thousand people demonstrated in London, the fact that Jewish Voices yes. for Peace blocks Congress, uh, the fact that there's direct actions all, all all over the world, the fact that, and I know it in my personal like you know life, and uh, since October seventh, I know people that have stopped everything, everything to to work on helping this massacre to to end. And, and if we don't hold on to this beauty, and I remember Howard Zinn said it very well, that the, the path to victory, whatever victory is going to be, has to be joyful and exhilarating. Uh, because we, you know, m my life of activism started maybe 20 years ago. And in the last 20 years, I've made friends that I consider like brothers and sisters. And it didn't happen before the, the, the praxis of activism in a way. So this is something we need to hold on to. Otherwise, we do crumble. And we're not any good if we crumble. We're not any good for the Palestinian people, for, for anyone. Right. right. Uh, and I wanted to, to, to pick, pick up on something you said and you wrote about, actually, uh, in The Compass of Morning, the piece you wrote for the London Review of Books. Um, you said that we can choose to be ignorant, but at what costs? Um, for those whose moral position is restricted to condemnation alone, understanding the situation is not the goal. Moral outrage of this sort is argu arguably both anti-intellectual and presentist. But that's what, like, since October 7th, the people that have tried to understand what's happened and why, which is not the same as condoning, obviously, and saying it's good, have been portrayed as the monsters and the people that condemn Hamas and condemn and condemn and condemn have been put on a, on a pedestal. I also have experience of people that I've been talking to privately that have told me, well, what happened on October 7th? I reacted very strongly against Hamas and the Palestinians on October 7th, but since then, Yes, my path to understanding how these things can happen has evolved. So I think there is a bit of potential good coming out of, of this. But but what did you mean by that? That you know, because well, you actually said that um, outrage could also drive a person to the history books. So what do you yes. mean by that? Uh, well, look, um, let me let me say just a, a few things because you started with this question of joy and celebration and you know um Palestinian friends of mine talked about going to Washington and marching and chanting and um and finding themselves in the arms of strangers you know like other Palestinians they did not know who were undergoing unbearable um shock and outrage and grief and you know just holding each other. And um, that's a beautiful thing, that kind of solidarity, uh, people there for one another in a, in a very basic way. Um, and, and, and I also then heard stories about coming back from these marches and feeling like, okay, I can, I can start again. You know, I'm not alone. I'm not going to go mad. I'm not alone with my psyche. I'm part of a community I'm working with and for others and my individuality is not as important as this um, solidaristic exercise I'm part of, which gives which gives joy and gives meaning and community. So all of that is important. Um, and and I think that Jewish Voice for Peace has been kind of brilliant as, and I I have been part of Jewish Voice for Peace, and I serve on the advisory board for Academic Freedom and. I do fundraising for them, and I don't know. I've been with them almost since the beginning. I guess I joined a couple of years after the inception. But you know, the um, 
the footage of um, taking over Grand Central Station in New York or the Statue of Liberty in New York or blocking the congressional offices or stopping traffic on the Manhattan Bridge in, in Manhattan or the Oakland uh, Federal Building or the ports of Oakland, you know, all of these are just so exciting. You know, you see, you know, this is a, a media moment, but it's also a moment of enormous exhilaration for people um, that they can do something, that they can voice an opposition, that they can make it more difficult for the Biden administration as their polling now shows. Very foolish. But, um, but look, uh, um, I mean, when I wrote the London Review book piece, I was, um, of course, like many people, quite shocked that Hamas was able to breach the border to um, to kidnap, to kill, um, uh, apparently to rape as well. Uh, I, I was I was shocked because we're not used to that. Right. And as a Jewish person, even an anti-Zionist now for many decades, um, I think that I probably had a moment where I thought, oh, um, I feel what many Jewish people feel. Um, let me use this moment of shock, uh, fear, condemnation. Uh, let me use this as a teachable moment, because I know that most of my Jewish uh, colleagues in the world <laughs> are going to go straight for war. And um, so I tried to use it as a moment, but unfortunately I was speaking uh, mainly to those who are in the center or who are not sure of how to handle this situation. And uh, I'm afraid my Palestinian allies did not feel spoken to by that piece. So that was uh, very uh, difficult for me and remains so, but I am seeking to make reparations in, in various ways. Um, that said, um, I understand what it is to condemn. I can condemn. I did condemn. I also want to stand back for myself and say, um, it's not enough to condemn. We actually, I and mean, it's not enough to start with October 7th. We need to understand the last 75 years of uh, settler colonial domination of Palestinian life. Um, this violence does not come from nowhere. Hamas was formed in the aftermath of Oslo. Oslo was for almost every Palestinian I know, a massive betrayal. Promises were made that were broken at the moment they were made. Um, promises of self-governance were not kept. Uh, more land theft uh, took place. More intense militarization took place. So Hamas historically comes into being at a certain point. Um, it is important to understand that because if we're imagining a future in which violence can cease, we need to understand the origins of violence so we can address those conditions and open up a different kind of future, right? What were the conditions that produced uh, an armed resistance to settler colonial power? What is the history of armed resistance such that we can, we can say when and where movements of armed resistance actually agreed to give up their arms? Well, not until state violence ceases, not until decolonization is underway as a, a, a very serious process or complete. Um, so it's, it's not foolish to turn to the history books. It's necessary if we want a nonviolent future and a future of cohabitation in that region, whether it's one state or two state or federated or whatever form of governance, we, we need to know this history. Um, it's not uh, exoneration to understand where Hamas comes from. It's the only way we will also come to understand the ongoing effects of Israeli state violence and be able to call for its end. And when it ends and when Palestine is free, we're going to turn around. Nobody's going to need violence. I mean, uh, there'll be joy. There'll be emancipation. There'll be there'll be freedom, right? That, that, that is what the Palestinian people 
uh, deserve life and freedom. And um, I, I, I think the will to ignorance is a, a very serious thing. Um, it keeps people in panicked, fearful, moral positions of condemnation so that anything they hear is a sign, oh, that you're in favor of Hamas. And what I'm saying right now could be the basis of somebody else saying, oh, Butler's in favor of Hamas. I've never been in favor of Hamas. I've never, you know, sorry, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's the name of Palestinian resistance now. Eh, not for me. No, that's not going to happen. Never did happen. You know, even when I said Hamas and Hezbollah part of the left, all I was trying to say, if the clip had continued, and this is what I did say, is that armed resistance movements do, like the Irish Republican Party, army, the Irish Republican Army, give up violent resistance under certain conditions. What kind of diplomatic possibilities are there? Nobody's asking that question. Anyway, sorry, I went off uh, on a tangent. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm nearly finished with the question as well. You, okay. you, you mentioned ignorance, but I think it actually goes further than that. It's also cognitive dissonance, right? Because some people's, people have learned, they need to unlearn things. And it's very hard because it's also a question of privilege, right? And, and I'm a strong believer that uh, and I think this is something from Arundhati Roy. She said, like, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Yes. And I really do think that a lot of people see it. But, but, but unseeing it will require so much work and so much changing everything they believed in and, and, and giving away some of the privileges that they'd rather say I'm ignorant. But it's, I, I don't buy it. I think they know. I mean, people know, anyone with a brain right now knows what's happening in, in, in Palestine, but you have to, um, you know, people just want to hold to their beliefs, some, some for political gains, some for money, some for, um, but anyway, uh, you can comment on this if you want, but my last question uh, is going to be, um, I, I've been involved with, the, the Palestine, Israeli Palestine question for about 15, 20 years now. Uh, and I've lived through moments like Operation Cast Lead, like, you know, I can't remember the names of the operations, where I remember as activists, we kept telling ourselves that this is going to change everything. I remember after Operation Cast Lead, after the Free Gaza flotilla, when Israeli commandos boarded the Mavi Mamara and executed nine civilians, including a Turkish American civilian. We kept saying, if this is going to change everything, Israel can't go back. You know, this is diplomatically, it's over for them. You know, they've shot themselves in the foot. Ilan Pape said a few days ago in an interview, this is the beginning of the end for Israel because they need the, you know, we are this small country surrounded by enemies and you know we're gonna die if we don't do what we do but he, but then he continued you know after operation cast led another operation israel went back to like you know getting the red carpet treatment uh in uh, in france etc how do we make sure that actually this moment does change everything um well, I don't know whether this moment will change everything. Um, I do think there is more dissensus on the state of Israel than there was before. That sometimes it's privately confessed, but other times it's publicly manifest. And I think uh, international, a global global opinion <laughs> will shift. Whether governments respond to that or not is another question. They have their own military contracts. They have their own reasons for keeping Israel afloat and defending it no matter what atrocities it commits. But I um, I don't, I, th I think there, it is a crisis moment um, and crises do produce potentials of certain kinds. The um, uh, intensification of dissensus of more people breaking with the consensus on Israel, criticizing it, uh, not just for its actions,
but for its longstanding practices and for the structural violence that is built into the state itself. Um, but right now, censorship is so high that it's really hard to say anything um, without being uh, assumed uh, to be uh, a violent actor in the scene. Uh, if you're, I, I, so the the struggle will also be against censorship, um, against um, dank fabot, <laughs> um, thought police, uh, uh, and the struggle will also be um, about forming uh, transnational forms of of solidarity that can put pressure on international institutions and state governments because otherwise we will all be left uh, with each other as the powers that be continue to do exactly what they're doing now. Um, Omar Barghouti has always said um, that a revolution can take a hundred years and he reads Nelson Mandela and on time, what is the time of revolution? It's usually not a single moment. It's not like the immediate aftermath of a major crisis. Uh, political constellations get reformed in the aftermath of a political crisis, but this crisis might may well be the accumulation, the, the manifest moment of a structural violence that has been there for 75 years. And if that's the case, then nothing less than a systemic analysis and critique of, of this form of state violence uh, will suffice. Um, reformist um, options are are not um, are not useful be, if if state violence is being reproduced in a daily way, not just in Gaza but in the West Bank and um, and through the and. I'm thinking here about the dispossession of of several Palestinian uh, people from their from their villages um, as settler violence increases and is encouraged by the Israeli state. So, what's the hope I have? Well, the hope I have is that all the censorship that's going on shows that there's something uncontainable. <laughs> They're trying to contain something they fear is out of control and uncontainable. So censorship is like an index because you can't stop us from speaking everywhere. You can't stop us from thinking everywhere to talking with one another unless you are willing, censors, you censors, to become true authoritarians. And some are. And some are. But then we're no longer talking about democracy. We're talking about authoritarianism. Um, so nothing less than the ideal of democracy is at stake. And uh, I can only hope that people continue to rise up in whatever ways they can. Um, and maybe we need to think about uprising in, in multivalent ways, not just the violent uh, form, but various nonviolent forms that also have enormous impact, like the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. I mean, this is the moment to expand that. And I can only hope that more people will see that as a viable way to put pressure on that state and that more states will also enter into sanctions and boycotts you know, as a way of exercising power. That's my, my modest hope. Thank, thank you, Judith, really uh, a million. Um, okay, thank you, Frank. I, I wish I could, um, I could hug you because- yeah, yeah. Yeah, I send you a virtual hug, but um, it's it's much it's so much needed, you know, feeling close to people, you know. Yeah. And and this is what these conversations are, are about. Actually, most of the people I've spoken to are, are friends, so um, it's just a way for me to connect with uh, with people I really admire and like and respect. So um, thanks again, Judith. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I hope. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.